Welcome to the Aaron Harbor Show. This is part one of our special two-part series with Stanford psychology professor and author of Bias, Jennifer Eberhardt. Jennifer, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thank you for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. I, you know, the, the book was just extraordinary. I've never read anything like it. Biased, mm -hmm. uncovering the hidden prejudice that shapes what we see, think, and do. So I very much want to talk about, in fact, I, that's almost all I want to talk about <laughs> is the book. But before I do, uh, I want to mention your uh, uh, MacArthur Genius Fellowship recipient. Congratulations. Thank you. That's that's extraordinary, but it also speaks volumes about who you are. So congratulations again. And you're the co-director of Spark, the Social Psychological Answers to Real World Questions. What is Spark? It's we call ourselves a, a do tank rather than a think tank. And we work with practitioners. So it's researcher practitioner partnerships. And we work together to address significant social problems. Wow, that's a great idea. OK, I want to jump, if I can, uh, right into the book. And, and you talk about bias and racism and unconscious bias. But let's, what is bias compared to racism? So this unconscious bias, we also call it implicit bias, can be defined as the beliefs and the feelings we have about social groups that can influence our, you know, our decision making and our actions even when we're not aware of it. So it's distinct from racism or old-fashioned racism. You don't have to be a bad person. You don't have to burn crosses or anything like that. This is a, you know, a bias that is uh, something that is you know, unintentional, um, you know, but it can lead to pretty uh, devastating consequences at times. So you certainly can be unconsciously biased. Mm -hmm. um, can you be unconsciously racist? So, I don't know. So when I think when people think of the term racist, they're not thinking about someone who's not aware of it. And, you know, they're thinking of someone who's spewing hate and all of that. And so 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 that term is something that you don't find a lot of researchers using who focus who are interested in bias and do research on bias. Is it fair to say I'm just thinking of people I've encountered um, my sense is most people I've encountered who are racist don't think they're racist. Mm -hmm. Is that, does that make any sense? Or can you make any sense of that for me? I, well, I think it is the case that most people who, um, you know, think they're, you know, not by, you know, that most people don't um, sort of recognize uh, that they could be biased. I mean, that's the part of it that's unconscious. That's the part of it that's implicit. And it's something not only do they not recognize it, sort of oftentimes people around them don't recognize it. I, I think with um, people who we would classify as racist, um, you know, even if they don't identify themselves as racist, there are lots of people um, around them that may uh, think that that's the case. Uh, they also don't have a problem with saying, you know, uh, you know, expressing uh, stereotypes and um, expressing their sort of negative uh, feelings about various groups. It's just they don't like the label. Can you, um, let's say you have uh, a number of inherent biases. Mm -hmm. Over time, could you become racist? Yeah, you could. I, I mean, I think that that... Um, is a good question because as the social norms change and shift, um, as we move away from becoming, uh, you know, from sort of valuing uh, being egalitarian, you can have, you know, something that's a bias that can, you know, is encouraged to grow and develop and it could become more explicit. It could become, you know, it could go into, move into this category of, of being what we would call racist. Because one of the things that occurs to me I want to talk about later is just in, in our society, why there was a, a huge move towards integration and, and various mechanisms, devices, programs to promote that. Uh, in the last couple decades, certainly there's been, there also have been forces that have moved us to be more segregated. Yeah. And, and so I'm curious if, if you grow up in a, uh, or live in an integrated uh, community, do you think people 
growing up in those communities are less likely to be racist or even biased? That's a great question. I think it depends on the nature of the integration. Uh, so there's a lot of research, you know, for decades this has been researched in social psychology is this idea of contact and, you know, does contact, um, you know, improve people's uh, racial attitudes. And for a long time people thought that sheer contact would, right, that, that uh, bias or prejudice or, you know, um, you know, stereotyping is all based on ignorance. And so when you bring groups into, you know, relation and contact with one another, you know, they will uh, replace those uh, stereotypes and they'll replace the prejudices with, um, with more informed um, information, you know, more, in they'll replace those prejudices with something that's more informed. Uh, but it, it turns out that the nature of the contact matters. And so if you're living um, together, say, in an integrated space, but there are huge, um, you know, disparities in terms of power, um, in terms of status, um, you know, usually that doesn't, um, you know, lead to positive attitude change, especially about the group that is in the lower power position. Um, also, if you're in a situation where the leadership doesn't condone, um, you know, that integration or the, or the contact, uh, if you're in a situation where it's competitive rather than cooperative, and so the best kind of contact that will lead to positive attitude change would be contact that's equal status where you're working together cooperatively on shared goals and you have leadership um, in that space that um, values that contact. What, what about uh, just your sense in terms of the culture? I mean, certainly if you look, for example, at television mm -hmm. uh, Andy, and music uh, 40 or 50 years ago, uh, and compare it today, you, you certainly have a, a whole different uh, integration of, yeah. of people uh, that everyone's paying. How, yeah. Do you have a sense of how that may have Impact. Well, we do know that millennials are very, um, they value diversity quite a bit, a lot more than older people do. And um, when they enter the workplace, they're demanding that diversity, they're expecting that diversity. Um, so I, I think the, the values have shifted that with the younger generation, uh, you know, it's, it's something that they, you know, expect and that they want and, uh, you know, they anticipate. So, so, so that's changed over time. So maybe the generation after them and the generation after them could really change the face of society. Maybe, yeah. Well, let's hope so. <laughs> I, mean, yeah. well, we can, I, I guess that means getting rid of the older folks. But, uh. <laughs> but even the older folks can change. You know, there's um, new data out looking at uh, people's attitudes about gay marriage and uh, you know, uh, you know, sexual orientation and you know, even implicit bias is, you know, um, directed towards people who um, are, um, you know, gay or lesbian. And uh, that has uh, declined uh, quite sharply over the last uh, decade, I believe. So. Oh, yeah. So uh, in, fact, in fact, that's really when you think about it, um, that's an amazing phenomenon. Yeah, it is. How quickly that has changed where uh, you had liberal politicians a decade ago uh, not supporting mm -hmm. certain gay rights or gay marriage. Yeah. Uh, and now, I mean, not everyone, but the, certainly the vast majority of Americans uh, believes that everybody should be entitled to, you know, those rights and those right. opportunities. That's right. Maybe there's hope for us <laughs> after all. <Maybe. laughs> all right, we're going to take a quick break. We will be back with Professor Jennifer Eberhardt in just a moment. For information on how to help promote civil and mutually respectful discourse and support expansion of the distribution of our programs, please email info at harbortv.com. I'm Aaron Harbor, host of The Aaron Harbor Show. I very much would like to hear from you about the program, so please send me an email with your thoughts. You can suggest what topics I should cover, what guests I should invite to be on the show, or even what specific questions you would like me to ask. This is your program, so send your suggestions to Aaron at HarborTV.com. I promise to personally read every one, so email me today. And most of all, thanks for watching. The Aaron Harbor Show may be viewed 24-7 at no charge from any location in the world at HarborTV.com. Welcome back to the show. Remember, this is part one of our special two-part series with Stanford professor Jennifer Eberhardt. 
So, Jennifer, I'd be, uh, you know, we were talking about culture and things. Another, I mean, uh, layperson observation is just the adulation uh, by everybody of all races uh, of a lot of sports stars. And we've had, uh, uh, you know, certainly racially uh, in the past for decades, but really seems to have been elevated to uh, a new level. And I'm wondering, you know, that you may just have a personal opinion, but uh, I don't know if you know of any research, but I mean, everybody loves LeBron James, for mm -hmm. example, or uh, some of the, uh, when you look at the popularity of specific players, mm -hmm. I think the NBA uh, may now rate uh, even above the NFL. Mm -hmm. uh, and well, baseball, nobody knows who baseball players <laughs> are anymore, even though that's my favorite sport, but that's another discussion. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you think that uh, the elevation of, of people has changed, especially people of color. Uh, but also what's changed in the past 20 years is people are seeing what extraordinary salaries or compensation uh, people are getting regardless of race, creed, color, sexual orientation or anything else. I mean, it's, it's just amazing you see uh, you know, people getting 100, 200, even $300 million contracts. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would think that that sends a message to everybody, but, but I don't know, did, is that anything you've thought about? Or? Well, it's not something I've researched, but I, I wonder if, you know, part of the um, popularity and attention has to do with the social media, right? It's because a lot of these stars um, are um, in direct contact with the fans in a way, and they have followers and all of that. And we also have television with more than three stations, right? So you can, you, you have access, right, to all these games that you didn't have access to before. And so you can follow the players and follow the teams. So I think there's maybe, you know, just more of a connection there. So. Well, yeah, no, uh, yeah, some of them have millions of, of followers. Yeah. I think that's true. Mm -hmm. One of the things I'd really like to talk about, and you wove this, your own personal experience through the book, uh, and when I first r read about mm -hmm. it, when you were arrested and yeah. still in, in school, um, I, I, I didn't expect that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, of course, and then you weave, uh, you weave uh, that through uh, part of the book. Right. Tell me about that experience and, and um, what it motivated you to do. So, so, yeah, so this was an experience. It was the day before I was to graduate with a Ph.D. from Harvard. And so I was looking forward to that. And, in fact, I was chosen by my um, classmates to carry uh, the flag. So I was supposed to be the marshal uh, for the graduation and lead everyone into the uh, into Harvard Yard and all of that. So um, that's so a that's a big deal. It was, yeah, it was yeah. an honor. So I was definitely looking forward to it. But the day before, I was um, driving uh, with my friend, and we were headed back to her uh, apartment in Boston. Or you all had a catering business. We had a catering business, and so we had been up all night the night before making food for an event on campus and we're driving uh, with all our catering gear in the in the back and um, uh, headed towards her Boston apartment so we get pulled over by a police officer and you were and, right near your place too. yeah right near the entrance and yeah. so we didn't know what was happening and we you know had ob obeyed all the traffic rules so it was uh, we were just confused I guess about why we were being pulled over and um, when the officer approached the car he, we asked why we were pulled over, but he wasn't, you know, about to clear that up and was just demanding, you know, the license and proof of insurance and, you know, those kinds of things. And he was going back to his car, stayed there for quite a while. And my friend and I, it just left us wondering what's going on, what's happening. And then we were wondering if he thought the car was stolen. Uh, she, she lived in an area that was, um, you know, it was like, uh, what would you call it? It's like a... A, um, an area where there's mixed um, class. It was like middle class and um, working class and um, you know people who were struggling, to, like on Section 8, struggling right. to get by. Section 8 housing. Yeah, I'm sorry, yes, yeah. Section 8 and, housing. And it wasn't your car. Well, it was, it was my car, but she was driving right. it. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so we, we didn't know what was going on. And so, yeah, we thought maybe he thought the car was still, we didn't know. And, and it turns out, you know, it was, it was my car, but it was in my mother's That's name. That's what I meant, yeah. right. It was yeah. registered, not, it was registered. not to you. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And so it was a gift, basically, from my parents. And um, 
so he, the, one of the things that the officer came back and asked was uh, whether, whether I was the owner. And, uh, you know, I told him my mother's name and he wanted to know, you know, her birth date and her age and her social, social security number, which I didn't know her social security number, of course. So I don't think most of us yeah, know, know our parents. Uh, <laughs> I know. <laughs> in fact, I don't think our parents would ever tell us their yeah, social security true. number. <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought because maybe I didn't know the social security number, he thought the car was still, like we didn't have any idea. So then we saw a tow truck uh, come and park right in front of the car. and. Uh, we were wondering what was going on, and the, and the officer materialized right outside my door and said, you know, exit the vehicle. And we were like, what's happening? And he said the car was being towed because of expired tags. So the registration tags had expired six weeks um, before uh, this incident. And... Um, he was going to tow the car, and so he. That, the main thing about the whole thing, I mean, this was years ago, like over 25 years ago now, right? But I still remember um, his tone of voice. So I don't remember all the words that were exchanged, but he was incredibly rude and uh, disrespectful in a way, you know, I'd never experienced before. And so that was the that was the main thing then, and then also uh, that's um, the main thing that I remember now. So, um, so I decided uh, that I wasn't going to get out of the car, right? So that was, you know, a decision. When I read that, you made me real nervous. Mama. Yeah, <laughs> I'm young, right? I'm in my 20s, and I felt like I had a right to protest because, you know, I didn't like the way we were being treated. I didn't think it was fair. I didn't think it was right. So I decided I was just going to sit in the car. So the officer called for backup, and so another cruiser came, another cruiser, another cruiser, another one. So we ended up being surrounded by five uh, police cruisers, and this is all over, you know, these expired tags. And then there was a crowd that gathered on the street of people who lived in that. Um, it was a pretty large apartment complex, and so a lot of you know people had gathered along the street, you know, to see what was going on. So we got nervous. Um, I, you know, my feeling uh, moved from you know feeling very, um, uh, what would you call it, just. Uh, defiant uh, empowered. even, or empowered to uh, feeling uh, like we we're in trouble. Uh, so then I was fearful about getting out of the car at that point. I didn't know what was going to happen. Um, the officer ended up, you know, opening the door and um, he pulled me out of the car and I uh, put my hands behind my back, you know, thinking I'm going to get handcuffed. But he, he uh, put my hand way above, like high on my back, and he lifted my body up in the air, and he body slams me really hard on the roof of the car. So not the hood, but like up on the roof. And it just knocked the wind out of me. I couldn't breathe. I was like, trying to, you know, uh, gasp, you know, for air and couldn't get air. And I, my body sliding down the car. and. I, mean, I remember hearing someone in the crowd asking, are, are you okay? And, and I couldn't answer. Because you couldn't uh, breathe. I couldn't breathe, yeah. So I fell to the ground. And so we ended up getting handcuffed. We were put in separate cruisers and um, taken to the police uh, precinct and handcuffed to a wall. So, uh, so that's, the <laughs> that's the story. Well, I, uh, but, but that... The end, well, I mean, I, I, I can tell you at part two. Yeah, I didn't know how long you no, wanted to go. <laughs> I think, I think just... everyone wants to know because when, you know, I, I was happy to hear about what happened, but it certainly isn't representative of what millions of people go through. Yes, that's true. But, but no, go ahead, finish the, finish the story. So we're in the precinct, uh, right? So we're handcuffed to this wall. And then I remembered, you know, when you, when there's an issue like this, uh, you can call your lawyer. You get one phone call. I knew that from watching television. <laughs> of course, I didn't have a lawyer, so I called uh, one of the deans at uh, Harvard and. I told her what happened. It's, it's funny because um, she was the one who uh, told me that I had gotten this honor of being the marshal and would carry the flag, and she'd gone through all the details of what route I would walk and so forth. And she gave me her card, and she said, if you run into any trouble, uh, don't uh, hesitate to call me. She so wasn't I, expecting I, No, that. she wasn't. <laughs> so I had her ca card, and I called. Oh, and so I you said, had it with you. I had it with and me. And she happened to be in her office. She happened to be in her office. She because in those hey, days, no cell phone, no cell phone, no cell number on your card. Yeah, so that was lucky that I had the card. Oh 
and I was keeping it with me because I knew, you know, the graduation was the next day and yeah. I didn't know. Um, so, <laughs> so she, you know, asked to speak to someone uh, in authority there and gave the phone to one of the officers. And I don't know what she said to them, uh, but, you know, hung up and the officer handcuff, uh, un, um, locked us or, or took off the handcuffs and um, released us, basically. So, um, Did you have to sign anything? Did you just walk out? I, we were released on our own recognizance, but I don't remember if we signed anything or not. We, I just remember being free and, and not being uh, handcuffed to a wall. He unlocked us. We walked out, and the next day was graduation. I was all bruised up, so I wasn't sure if I could carry the flag, but I was determined to. Uh, it was heavy, and you know, I had to lift it up pretty high so that all hundreds of people behind me you know, could, could follow the path and could see the flag. And knew where to go, uh, but I, oh, my, you know, everything was hurting because of the body slam. I um, had, you know, swelling um, in my sternum, and then I had swelling in my uh, my wrists were uh, bruised up pretty bad as well. And so it was, uh, it was a difficult walk. And uh, I was happy though that I was able to just participate and that I made it through, and I wasn't handcuffed to a wall. Um, the next day, we had to appear in court uh, before a judge, and you know the judge is looking through the police report, not understanding what happened, and asking, was there a language barrier? And the dean showed up uh, with us at the <laughs> at the court date, and she says, "Oh no, you're you're, you're on it, not on this side, right?" And so. The judge. Um, That's just, a great line, by the way. Not on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so she, um, you know, just was. Think, you know, she said, "Well, I don't understand. You know what? You know what's going on? It's it's not um, against the law to sit in the car." And then she uh, was going through the report, and she read out uh, what the charge was. And it was assault and battery on a police officer. Oh my gosh! So we couldn't believe it, right? Because you know I was roughed up, but um, I, I was charged with assault and battery. And in the police report, it said it was because I uh, touched his hand with my finger when he had reached in the car to unbuckle me to pull me out. Uh, so that was the, the you know that was why that charge was there. So the judge looked at it and just decided she just. Uh, dismissed all the charges and and I'll never forget this uh, she says Dr. Eberhardt you are free to go and that was the very first time anyone had addressed me by that title that, that's such a great story um, I wish it could be replicated for a lot of people who uh, once they're handcuffed don't have obviously the you know the, the help that you have mm -hmm. uh, and I want to talk about that because yeah. one of the things we'll take a break but one of the things of course in your book is just how uh, many people uh, have been abused by police officers uh, and you also talk about the conditions under which uh, you know the police operate and how yes. difficult it is for them too so yeah. we'll talk about that when we come back with Dr. Eberhardt in just a moment for information on how to help promote civil and mutually respectful discourse and support expansion of the distribution of our programs, please email info at harbortv.com. Safely stop fires around your home. Introducing the Fire Ice XT 20 ounce aerosol canister. Fire Ice XT is an eco-friendly water-based fire suppressant gel. Unlike a traditional fire extinguisher, Fire Ice XT is a highly effective, non-toxic firefighting agent that is easy and safe to use around your home, family, and pets. Available at Amazon.com or call 800-924-4874. The Aaron Harbour Show may be viewed 24-7 at no charge from any location in the world at HarborTV.com. Welcome back to the show. We are with Professor Jennifer Eberhardt of Stanford University talking about her book, Bias. And what I would like to do is, is really hear from you about, we, you know, we talked about your uh, experience uh, when you were, you know, really very young, relatively young. Um, and uh, your work, you've done so much work, uh, and in the book talks about uh, just police behavior right. and, and how... Um, and, and I think you're, you know, you certainly uh, present an incredible amount of data, and I'd like you to talk about some of it in mm -hmm. terms of how people are biased and how there, I mean, there clearly have been and are police officers who are blatantly racist as well. 
Uh, but that you also talk about how the vast majority of police officers uh, are really just trying to do a good job and are really trying to serve their community uh, and, and don't have any intention or desire to be uh, racist or act in a racist way or even, even be biased. But nevertheless, there's just a lot of phenomenon that yeah. push people in that direction. Talk a little bit about that and yeah. some of the studies. I mean, there are. I think uh, one of the stories that I remember most uh, when I you know, talked to officers about bias is a person who was an officer who was from Germany. And he had been in this country for only about two years. But as soon as he had arrived, he decided he was going to uh, join the police department. So he's in the police department. And um, he started, he was saying how you know, quickly his mind started to, to change. Like in uh, Germany, he was, you know, just not uh, thinking about African Americans as associated with crime and as dangerous or any of that. But here, because of the police work, he started to feel that way. And a lot of the, you know, calls that he got, you know, these are uh, police uh, radio calls where people, you know, call in and they, you know, name a suspect. And oftentimes the suspect was African American and so forth. And so he, you know, after day after day of, of this and, um, you know, looking at who the suspects were, who were uh, mostly African American men, this was in a, a city that was um, pretty diverse. Um, he, you know, began to, um, you know, he could, he could see that he was becoming a lot more suspicious of, of black men generally. And so if he saw a black man, you know, that person would catch his eye. And if he, um, you know, moved his hands, he's wondering where his hands are. And he um, just felt like he had to be on high alert uh, because this was a dangerous person. And, uh, you know, he needed to, you know, to, to check him out and to, and to uh, make sure uh, that uh, this person couldn't do him harm. And he said his friends started noticing the change in him. And um, he had to recognize it himself that, it, you know, the police work, you know, was was changing uh, how he, um, you know, this, this, it, it was changing the associations that he had in his mind. And, and, and over time, and, and over a short amount of time, he developed this automatic association between blackness and crime uh, that was there uh, sort of regardless of, of, um, of it, it almost kind of developed because of the environment he was in, but not through any intention, uh, basically, um, you know, on his part. And so he just told me that story. It just made me um, realize how much um, the environment plays a big role in um, the uh, choices that police officers are making and how they, you know, do their jobs and like who they're focused on, you know, all of that. Um, because if you have, uh, you're in a situation where you have, you know, disparities in, in who's, um, you know, committing uh, crime, it, it, it leads you to, um, to think about um, people who fit that description, which is a broader description. It's male black, right? Um, people who fit that description now um, are, you know, people who could be dangerous, people who are, um, who you're suspicious of and, and, and so forth. And so you can, you can, I could see um, through his experience and he could see through his own experience that, um, you know, it, it was, it was changing his mindset. Well, and also, I mean, one of the uh, calculations you made, which uh, I thought was fascinating, is is often on the police dispatch. I mean, they talk in shorthand. Yeah. So if they're talking about a suspect, you know, a, a common phrase was male black. Right. And and w what you did was was calculate how many times right. uh, an officer might hear that, and you might hear that, you know, ten times a day. But over well, not, not or, ten or, times or, a day, I think, yeah. Or, well, maybe. But, Maybe more than that. I yeah. think it was like 60, uh, wow, well, geez. But you had, fit, well, one calculation was, was 50,000 times. A year. Yeah, yeah. that, yeah. that yeah. someone would hear that. And, yeah. and, 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 you know, my point is if you're hearing that yes. 50,000 times, yeah. it's going to imprint. Well, yeah. that's the end of part one of our special two-part series with Dr. Eberhardt. Make sure you watch part two. I'm Aaron Harbour. Thanks for watching. Thank you.
Please contact us. We want to hear from you. And thanks for watching.